Well, hello everyone. Some of you have been with this channel from the beginning and saw the various experiments that I had done. Now I'm ready to engage in some regular content. And I have, which at least to me, is a very exciting series for you. Tell you all about it after the little bumpy dump here. All right, so what's this pink hair devil up to? Well, this is my plan. I love history. I love party history, as you know, and so do a lot of you. I don't know nearly enough about it, and I would like to learn more with you. So if I can take you along in my journey of learning, then my time is multiplied. So here's the plan. I have here this, this wonderful notebook of goodies that I'll, that I'll show you in a moment. But here's my plan. I am going to go through the official newsletter of the party, LP News, from the first one all the way up through the present. There's a lot of them. There's 300 and something. And my goal is every other week. I don't know yet what specific day we'll work that out, but every other week. I'm going to shoot for every week, but I think that might be a little too ambitious because I also have a podcast that I urge you to check out, which is the Big L Podcast, which deals with some of the same information, but different angles. And it's a different format. So if you can't get enough of me, I get enough of me. My husband gets enough of me. Believe me, if you if you can't, God bless you. Uh, go check out the podcast. I'd really appreciate it. And I will be doing also some patron-only content. I'm trying to turn this into something that I could do more of. So if you're happy just watching the ones that are on here, it'll be more than enough. Wonderful. If you'd like to support my work and get some tidbits, please do. The patron link or Patreon link will be in the low bar. So we'll be starting with the first issue and marching on down. I have with me here the first issue. As far as I know, and again, this is not going to be scripted. We are literally going to go through these together. If there are any awkward pauses or where I got to read for an extended period of time, I'll obviously edit that out. I'm not reading them ahead of time. My reaction, the things I'm getting out of it, it'll be live with you, you know, and I'd love to hear your questions on further things we can explore. What would the possible bonus episodes be? Well, in the beginning, in the beginning, God said, let there be the statement of principles. No, well, maybe, but that's not what I mean. In the beginning, there was very little party was tiny. But as we move forward, there are other things that might have happened at that same period of time. We read about it in LP News, and there might be supplemental material, like maybe there's a video, or maybe there's an interview or an article that can tie into the LP News issue we just went through. Or maybe there are state newsletters from that same period. That's what the supplemental episodes will be. And, just thinking, everyone who becomes a patron of the Big L Podcast will automatically become a patron of this show as well. So if you're interested in both products, that's the best bang for your buck. Alrighty, let's get started. Now, the Libertarian Party was formed officially in December 1971 in Colorado. Colorado Springs. So Westminster tries to take some of that glory. Westminster is where David Nolan lived. I will put a picture up here where I actually went to the address and took a picture out in front of it. And people are like, you are stalking that poor man after he's dead. Yeah, I am. So I went there and took a picture. 
and it was kind of amazing. I don't know. I got a little bit of the woo. I got a little bit of the woo tingles. So David's house was in Westminster. Most of the meetings were there, but the final meeting was in Colorado Springs. I kind of think Westminster has the better claim, but it's a toss up, right? So what I have here, and you won't be able to obviously see it well with me holding it here, I will put a scan of it, you know, up along with me, and I will provide a link where you can peruse the scan at your leisure at Elpedia, Just anything you would like to, you know, extract from it. This, I believe, is the only copy of this that exists. I had been hunting high and low. When I received the newsletters from National, I noticed they started with number two. That broke my heart. I'm like, okay, libertarians can be kooky. Maybe they did just start with number two, but I suspect there's a number one out there. And I think issue number two was January of 1972. We'll know soon because that will be the next episode. So I'm like, what would number one be? December, when it was actually formed? And was it even called LP News? Because there wasn't really an LP. Well, all those mysteries were solved. As some of you know, David Nolan's widow, Elizabeth, kindly, awesomely, gifted his remaining archives to the Libertarian Party Historical Committee, of which I am a chair. Not a chair, the chair. But hopefully the committee will last a long time and I'll be one of the chairs. I will be a chair. Eh, rabbit trail. This was in his records. There probably was very few of these ever printed off. But there it was. And at first I didn't know what it was. It doesn't say LP News on it, obviously. So how do I know? that this is actually issue one. As you see, it says right there, newsletter number one. This is a precious artifact of history. And we can see in the, and I will be having to put on my funk dump glasses here in a minute. You'll see the letterhead at the top is a committee to organize a libertarian party. And the address is on Lowell, Lowell Boulevard in Westminster. Westminster, which is where I took that photo. That's where I got the address from. Like them? I like them. They suit my personality quite well. So what's in this? What's in this newsletter? It's small enough that I think I'm going to read a lot of it and we'll talk about it. The longer ones we're going to summarize. So it says of the date of this newsletter, November 15th, 1971. Remember, the party was formed December. This is before the birth of the party. The committee had 63 members, and this represents a doubling of the membership last month. And we expect to continue doubling in size every month for several months and may do even better during the next few weeks as a major feature article on the Libertarian Party concept will be appearing in the individual list shortly. I want that issue. Does anyone have a copy of that issue of the individual list? If I can hunt that down, that would be a great bonus episode, wouldn't it? I, I, now I've got, I've got a new mission. So based on the responses we received on our preliminary questionnaire, we have a good idea of who we will be appealing to and have been able to make certain basic decisions. Our findings and the conclusions we have drawn from them are as follows. This will be a young party. The average age of those who have returned their questionnaires to date is 28, with one-fourth of the respondents being over 30, one-fourth under 20, and half in their 20s. Our support is overwhelmingly drawn from people who have in the past supported the GOP. Over 75% are Republicans or ex-Republicans, with most of the others having no party affiliation at the moment. Philosophically, the breakdown is. Now, what's interesting 
Today, we often hear a lot about the anarchists, the minarchists, the classical liberals. That isn't the way the party always broke down. I dealt with this in some of the talks I had given on the Statement of Principles. But the term minarchist didn't even appear in this letter. And I'm going to be very interested in discovering with you when that started to become um, very dominant within the party. Okay. So here's the breakdown. Objectivist, which is basically a Randian fan of Ayn Rand, a follower of her objectivist philosophy, 36%. Misesist. Ludwig von Mises' um, uh, followers, uh, 23%. Anarchist, 17%. Yeah, there were no anarchists in the early party, but that's none of my business. Heinleinist, 16%, with the remaining scattered. Minarchists and classical liberals not mentioned there anywhere. Well, anarchists are. A substantial majority of the respondents felt that five or six dollars was the reasonable amount for an annual membership. And a number also indicated there should be a graduated due system to permit students to join without undue financial strain. Remember, 1971, we have adopted the following due structure. Student membership, four dollars. Regular membership, six dollars. Sustaining membership, twelve dollars. In addition, we have created two categories of membership to recognize the contributions of major financial supporters. A life membership was $100 then. It's $1,500 now. I'm a life member. Wish I'd got one back then. I was only uh, four years old, but still, my parents should have thought of this. And life sustaining membership, now I wonder what the difference is, $250. We're going to have to track down what the difference is. In order to encourage prompt enrollment, it was also decided that anyone who pays his dues, or his or her dues, it actually says, for 1972 on or before December 15th may deduct, and then it says from his dues. They didn't do his or her there. Needed to proofread better. The $2 he paid to join the organizing committee. So the 63 members of the organizing committee paid $2 each. And as a side note, we take this for granted, but this was done on a typewriter. Just, just so you know, it's interesting the way the underlines are. So the words like are individually underlined rather than what we're used to seeing on a computer word processor. Regarding preferences for a name for our new party, there was an overwhelming margin in favor of Liberty Party. And in a way, wish we chose that. We would still be called libertarians, probably, but there's a reason why I'm going to say that. And I might as well explain it now. The word libertarian is an old word. It means something different in America than in Europe. The word libertarian in Europe has traditionally meant um, ANCOMs, um, anarchist communists, like complete opposite. We, um, we uh, lifted the word and made it our own with a different meaning. And while words do change and there's no such thing as intellectual property, it's caused some confusion. And people who aren't aware of the European history get like, like flustered when they run into a libertarian socialist who inform, and they go, what do you mean you're a libertarian socialist? I'm an octopus banana. And they think that's so clever. It actually shows historical ignorance because libertarian socialists or libertarian communists were the first libertarians. But it was a different time. The American version is not that. So while, yes, the socialists have a point that there existed the word libertarian socialist, Words are not magic. Words are just placeholders for meaning that we use so that we can communicate. They're quite um, arbitrary. I mean, the word libertarian could have been soda can. But as long as we all agree on pouring a certain meaning into it, it doesn't matter what the combination of letters is. And in America, it's not communism.
or socialism. But it has been across the pond. Okay, there were four choices given. However, there were many write-ins for Libertarian Party as well. For this reason, we are asking you to give your preference between these two names. Please use the attached form. I do not have that form. It may turn up in some records, but right now, the attached form is not included on here. That's on most wanted list right there. And it just occurred to me, I think I have some membership cards from the day. It might not be this early, but I think I have membership cards from 1974. That would be great for a bonus episode. Regarding convention time, there was also a dichotomy. Preferences were divided evenly between late March and early June, and we ask you give us this additional data on the form. Both times have their strong and weak points, and early convention gives us more time to get on the ballot and promote our platform and candidates, but a late convention will give us more time to prepare, to locate candidates, and to build up membership. Incidentally, over 80% of those responding have indicated they would be interested in attending, exclamation point. 75% indicated that we should run candidates for president and VP. 60% favor running candidates for lower offices. Therefore, if possible, we will do both. Suggestions for candidates were numerous, over 40, altogether. Over 40, altogether, sorry, airplane joking. Don't call me Shirley. Can you fly this plane and land it? Shirley, you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. But less than one third were mentioned by more than three people. Those most often suggested were the following. Please give us your thoughts on these people using the attached form. Martin Anderson, author of The Federal Bulldozer. Anyone heard of that? I'd like to see some. Is that a book? I'm going to look that up on Amazon. The Federal Bulldozer. That would be some interesting bonus episodes too, wouldn't it? Yeah, I did. Representative Philip Crane, Republican, Illinois, sponsor of H.R. 1258, a bill to legalize gold ownership, generally a Buckley-style conservative, but much more hardline than Buckley. Senator Sam Irvin, the Senate's leading uh, uh, Democrat, North Carolina, the Senate's leading authority on constitutional law, an economic conservative, and the leading opponent of wiretapping, no-knock, etc. A. Ernest Fitzgerald, head of the National Taxpayers Union, and the man who exposed massive waste in Pentagon spending. Milton Friedman, no noted Chicago school economist, opponent of the draft, originator of the Guaranteed Income Plan. Boo, hiss on the Guaranteed Income Plan. Anyway. Representative H.R. Gross, Republican, Iowa, the House's number one opponent of government spending. Votes no on everything. Strong isolationist. We'll see this as we go on. I know now we call ourselves non-interventionists, but the early party had no problem calling themselves isolationists. A good portion of them felt that's what we were. Senator Mark Hatfield, Republican, Oregon, a sometime opponent of the draft and of military spending, bad on domestic spending, pro-freeze, and very religion-oriented. Robert Heinlein, libertarian science fiction author, Stranger in a Strange Land, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Glory Road, etc. If you have not read Moon is a harsh mistress. Do it now. It's awesome. And it will teach you libertarianism when you don't even, you just start loving the book. Carl Hess, once, once a speechwriter for Barry Gold, Goldwater, now a self-styled new left anarchist. Carl Hess is very important and very interesting. If you get into discussions with the aforementioned libertarian socialists, they will often bring up Carl Hess, because Carl Hess, I believe, I'm going to get more confirmation on this, but I'm going to go with it, did label himself a libertarian socialist, but he did not mean by it what these other people mean. Um, he meant, from what I understand, 
sort of a voluntary communitarian, which there's absolutely no problem with that. It's, it's when you start denying that there is ontologically such thing as private property that there's a problem. So maybe that's why it says new left, not sure. Vivian Kellums, one, word, one woman scourge of the IRS. I would like to be a one woman scourge of something. That'd be great. Currently engaged in a battle to reduce taxes for single taxpayers. Recently led the successful battle to repeal the Connecticut state income tax. Henry Mann, Stanford law professor, who has battled Ralph Nader over consumer protection laws and has written for Barron's and the Freeman. Senator William Proxmere, Democrat, Wisconsin, strong proponent of economy and government, although his record on non-defense spending is mediocre, uncompromisingly against the Vietnam War and the draft. So that is the first, the first issue. And you notice certain themes coming out of here. There's a lot of concern for the draft and the Vietnam War. It's hard for us today, particularly those of us who were just babies then or not born yet, to put ourselves into that time period. But we need to. Perhaps we should do some digging into some of the social unrest that happened around the Vietnam era and the draft. I think that would be somewhat fantastic. Another idea for a bonus episode. We could have like such an interesting walk through history. And I think there was another thing I wanted to highlight here, but it was, I know the draft like popped out right in my head. You notice there's a healthy mix here between Republicans and the Democrats. So that was very pleasing. All right. I hope you enjoyed this first walkthrough. I already learned like so much just sitting here and I know I keep, keep just staring down at it lovingly. Yeah, because I'm like, my precious, my precious, I want to have your baby. I know, I'll add. So I do hope you enjoyed it and that you will come back for the next episode, I guess that's what we'll call it, right? Which will be in about two weeks, give or take. That's the commitment I'm trying to make to you. In the low bar, there will be my patron feed and a link to the Big L podcast. I would be so appreciative of your support. Thank you and have an awesome day. Doodles. And cheers. You gotta take what you're given, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in a business Not because they wanna do it